The Zone presents Armageddon Expo Awesomenessness, a state of constant awesomeness. Get ready to put your hands together for the prodigal son, Manu Bennett. He's been and obviously plays uh, Deathstroke and Arrow. I know Slade. He is not going to stop until. Welcome home. <laughs> TV series from the famous Terry Brooks novels, Crosschurch. A big round of applause, Mr. Manu Bennett. Thanks, guys. Awesome, awesome. You know, I've uh, I've spent a few hours the last couple of days walking around your city and seeing uh, what a rebuild's going on down here. And, uh, you know, you can listen to it on the news, you can, uh, you know, you can try to imagine what it's like, and it's not until you get down here and you sort of see, uh, you know, the, uh, the energy of the city trying to thrive between the, the ruins and trying to lift the city back up. And I'm, uh, I'm really sort of, uh, I don't know, I'm, 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 I have a new opinion of Christchurch as being a real city of survivors. You, you, I mean, you, you, you could call yourselves like Starling City. You know? hey, so, so way to go, guys. Honestly, uh, it's, 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 a, it's, it's a real, uh, a real huge uh, scenario that you guys are going through together. And, uh, you know, it's good to see everyone pulling together. Now, uh, you know, you, you probably know me from, uh, I don't know, who's, who's Spartacus fans out there? Uh, Arrow fans? Wow, how did that happen? <laughs> For a minute there, I thought I'd always just be Crixus, you know? <laughs> and suddenly Slade Wilson came along, Deathstroke. Uh, Arzog fans. Yeah! Oh, yeah. <laughs> can see one there. Uh, yeah, well, who knows anything about, who knows anything about Terry Brooks and a series called Shannara? Oh, a couple of people? A couple, yeah, yeah. Because I, I got a feeling when I come down here again in maybe a couple of years, I'll go, who's a Shannara fan? And they, they hopefully will be a big surge and everyone will go, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, uh, yeah, that's, that's the new thing I've just signed on to, uh, which, is, which is pretty exciting. Uh, I was actually, I, I'd finished up on Arrow in uh, filming in Vancouver, and I moved down to uh, Los Angeles, uh, you know, like uh, probably about four months ago, five months ago. And, and, and I thought my life was going to be based in Los Angeles this year. Uh, I thought now's the time of... You know, done Spartacus and, uh, and Hobbit, and, and now I've, you know, gone abroad and filmed Arrow for a big American network, and I thought, now it's my time to do the American scene. And, uh, and funnily enough, the first audition that I got called in for, I go in and I said, where's it shooting? And they said, New Zealand. <laughs> 
So, uh, but you know, when it when it all came in and we and we looked at the contract and everything, you know, uh, there was there was nothing more more uh, I don't know fulfilling for me, even though I, I thought I was going to spend this year in America, than actually getting back to the same crew that I work with on Spartacus, because I know how dynamic and how wonderful the the, the creative talent here is in New Zealand. Uh, the producer of, uh, of of our show said that. You know, coming to New Zealand with the expectations that Shannara has got, in other words, to shoot a very uh, high-end fantasy series, television series, uh, that that coming here and realizing that our our, our practitioners, that our our uh, production teams are, can they they can so easily adapt to that genre, and it goes all the way back to uh, Hercules and Xena, really, and then into Lord of the Rings and Hobbit. Our, our people here in New Zealand are the best in the world at doing fantasy genre, uh, and you know it's. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you ever run into any production people, you can thank them. I mean, I, I seem to get the you know. I mean, when you're in the front of the camera, you seem to get the credit for it. But trust me, it's like there's hundreds of these people that do an amazing job with lighting and with sound and with special effects in post production. All of these guys are the real workload behind the series that, that comes across your screen. I'm just basically, I, I think I'm like the cow. I'm like the cow that's on front of the milk carton. <laughs> and you go, oh, that cow makes it look healthy. <laughs> Drink this milk. I'm the cow. But, uh, but you know, yeah, yeah, so much more work goes into it. And I'm just, uh, you know, I'm just really, really happy to be back in New Zealand and working with that amount of talent again on, uh, on Shannara. And, uh, I'm loving the character. I play this character called Alanon, and Alanon's a. Uh, some people make a comparison with Shannara and Lord of the Rings, because there's elves, there's uh, goblins, there's there's all this sort of like like uh, Shady Vale. There's a place called Shady Vale. You know, it's a lot like you know Hobbiton and stuff like this. So you know, it's. Uh, but I play basically the Gandalf character. But he's like Gandalf meets Slade Wilson meets Crixus. <laughs> so he's quite a badass druid. And, uh, and yeah, it's going to be interesting taking all of the things that I've taken out of the last few characters and kind of making them this character of Alanon, uh, including this haircut, by the way, yeah. When I got home with this, my daughter was like, Daddy, <laughs> what happened to your hair? Ribbon CK Oliver Queen. <laughs> no, just uh, yeah. It looks, you know, Steve's Steve's an amazing young talent, you know, uh, who's who's really done an incredible job as as the Arrow. Uh, you know, it was uh, it was it was quite a big journey uh, going going uh, to to Vancouver. It happened very quickly. I'll tell you a brief story about how I got the role for starters. Uh, the American military was really big, they were really big fans of Spartacus. As you can imagine, there's like a brotherhood of soldiers in a scenario where people are dying. And, uh, and you know, there's, there's a lot of threat and danger all the time for those boys. So uh, they, they identified with Spartacus. And there's, a, there's an organization that, uh, that basically gets entertainers to go and visit the troops, you know, when, the, when they're away doing, doing service. And uh, so we got asked by this organization to go to Afghanistan. And, uh, uh, you know, it was, it was, it was pretty uh, hair-raising at first. I went and saw my bank and I said, does my insurance cover me if I go to Afghanistan? And they said, no. It, it's a red zone. So if something happens to you when you're in a red zone, your life insurance isn't covered by the bank. Just to make you aware of that, if any of you plan to go and travel to red zones. So uh, it was a hairy situation and uh, we ended up flying into Kuwait and, uh, and, and going to a place called Camp Arafjan where we were then going to be helicoptered up to Afghanistan. Now, probably fortuitously, uh, some heavy stuff went down in Afghanistan at the time we were there and they cancelled us flying up in the Black Hawks. So we were going to go up in the Black Hawk helicopters. And they, they called it off, but uh, you know I'm, I'm sure that was for very good reason. Um, 
you know, but we were over there with these special forces guys and uh, all of these particular soldiers and uh, one of the special forces guys, I said to him, you know, well I went around because I wanted to find out who was like the Rambo. I said, who's like the toughest guy on the whole camp? And they said, oh, this guy called uh, Midnight. So I went looking for this guy and he was this bald older guy, you know, but supposedly he'd seen a lot of action. And, uh, and we were sort of all in this room together at one stage and I had a microphone and I said, Midnight, I want you to show me like a move, you know, like, like how do you, how do you like stealthily go into a, a scenario and like, you know, because I hear you've got to, you know, sometimes you've got to go into a village and you know, how do you like, and he, how do you take somebody down when you're in stealth mode? And so he showed me this chokehold and, uh, and he grabbed me in it. And I'm sure that he just wanted to show off a little bit in front of the rest of his boys and to show that he was as badass as he is. So he almost choked me out. I was sitting there, like, to be honest, kids, can you close your ears? But I grabbed him as hard as I could by his old gonies. <laughs> I swear to you, I was, I was like suddenly went into fight for life mode, you know, something just kicked in because I knew he was choking me out. So I grabbed him by the gonies and I'm like, Argh! and And he said he couldn't feel them for two days, but <laughs> but I think Midnight doesn't feel anything. He's, he's just a, he's, he's an interesting soldier. But, uh, you know, he, he almost choked me out and then, uh, then he let me go. But... Uh, I ended up making really good friends with him and a couple of guys. And when I left uh, Kuwait, and I, at the last second, I decided to fly through Los Angeles. I was coming back for the Hobbit premiere, but I decided I'd fly through Los Angeles for a couple of days and just stop there instead of flying back the other way, straight back to New Zealand. So, so I did that, and, and they all came and saw me off at the, at the airport. And one of the things that they do over there, all these soldiers, is, is that they, they, they all have on them those six-hour energy drinks. And they'd been giving them to me to sort of stay awake when I was there because of the jet lag. And so Knight came up to me and he said, here, something to remember us by. And I put this six hour energy drink in my bag and never thought anything more of it. When I got to Los Angeles, on the day that I was flying out, I was only there for like two days, and on the day that I was flying out, my manager rang me in the morning and she said, what time's your flight? And I said, well, I gotta be in the airport in four hours. She said, can you go and audition for this show called Arrow? And I said, are you kidding me? I've got, I've, got, I've, got to be at the, I've got to be at the airport in like four hours. She says, just go right now. Go straight to the studio. They've got sides there ready for you to read. And, uh, you know, you can get out. They'll be ready for you to, as soon as you get there. So I was like, oh, okay. This is fly by the seat of your pants. It's my job. I've got to go and do a read right now. So I, I, I got this car over to, uh, to this uh, studio in, in Los Angeles, in Hollywood. And... Uh, and I got in there and there was a, a group of guys all, they're all walking around like this going You know, actors when you go into audition scenarios look like a bunch of weirdos really. They're all talking to themselves and, and then I picked up this particular sheet of audition paper and it was this character called, and it wasn't Slate Wilson, it was like, uh, it was Holloway or something. And I was looking at it and I was going, okay, so the scene read that Holloway uh, drops, a dark figure drops through the, the roof of the fuselage of the plane. Remember on the island there was the aeroplane? And the very first scene that I ever did with the arrow was Slade Wilson dropped through the ceiling then jumped up behind him and grabbed him in a chokehold. <laughs> and I'm reading this and I'm going, ah, chokehold. That guy in Afghanistan, that guy in Kuwait taught me this chokehold. Oh, I forgot to tell you one more thing. When I got there, I felt really jet lagged because I'd flown like New Zealand to Kuwait. I was there for a few days and flown straight to LA, so I was really jet lagged. And I was, I was going, my, oh God, how am I going to get any energy? And I went, oh, midnight gave me this six hour energy drink. So I'd taken this energy drink out and sculled it about 15 minutes before I had to do my read. And I swear to you, when I read for Slade Wilson, I was on Mirakuru. <laughs> Because this stuff just suddenly I was like, and then when I went in there, I said, I, you know, I went in there and I, and I said, listen, in the script that says that he's got him in a chokehold, so can I get that young guy to come from behind the camera, the reader? Can I get him to come in front of the camera? Can I grab him in the chokehold? And at the same time, this 
caffeine was like exploding through my system. And come up here, kid. No, 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 you're too small, you're too small. Are you over 18? <laughs> Can you sign a waiver? Just stand on the stair here. You can't sue anyone in this country. Yeah, I know. Anyway, so... So the director's going like, you know, are you, are you ready? And I said, yeah, yeah. I said, kid, I'm just going to put you in a, in a chokehold, okay? But, I, you know, just don't worry about it, it's going to work. <laughs> so I grabbed this guy in this chokehold, right? And he said, are you ready to go? Are you ready to go? And, and by this time, I must have already started squeezing. <laughs> and, and, and the scene went like this, it went, you got 10 seconds to tell me something I believe, kid. I'm going to cut out your throat box. <laughs> Remember that scene? Yeah. Right, so here's me in the audition doing that scene, and I didn't realize I'm choking this kid out. <laughs> and just after I finished that line, this kid collapsed. <laughs> you don't have to do that here, just do that. <laughs> This kid collapsed. Good on you, kid. Unconscious. On the floor. I'm in the middle of Hollywood doing like one of my very first auditions thinking I'm never going to read in this town again. And I said, kid, I said, is this part of the scene? He said, no, I think you choked him out. Said, kid, are you okay? Are you okay? He was like, ugh. I said, kid, come on, come on. And, I, and the director said, go wash your face in the bathroom. So this kid went off to the bathroom to splash his face with water. And I was like, I'm really sorry about that. I just got back from Kuwait, you know, and this guy taught me this chokehold, and obviously it works. <laughs> but he was special forces, you know, and this guy's special forces, so... I'm sorry about it, you know, and I, I actually thought I was going to get kicked out. But the director, the casting director said, it was perfect. I, I, don't, I don't recommend anybody try that. <laughs> It was a very special moment. It was a special moment. I, I'll always think about this and go like, that's, that's Ben's reality. You know, it doesn't really happen like that. But, but you know, he, he said to me, look, it was, it was so good. It was so real. You put everything into it. It was fantastic. And uh, so I walked out and, I, and, I, and he said, look, just I'm going to call your agent and I'm going to call the producers. I think you've done a really good test. You're probably in for a chance at this. And so I went out and I rang my agent. She, she was like, oh, what happened, Mano? What happened? What happened? And I said, well, I choked the guy out for starters, unconscious. And she went, what? Mano. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, but they said it was really good. They loved it. So he went, oh, okay. So I went and jumped on a plane and I came back and I did the premiere for the first Hobbit movie. And uh, I got woken up at 8 o'clock the next morning from my agent. And she went, Mano, Mano, you've got the rule, you've got the rule. And I was like, uh... And, she, and I said, well, when are they shooting? And she says, you're on a plane tomorrow to Vancouver for six months. <laughs> and it was, you know, that's, that's what this life's like, I guess, as, you know, as an actor, you get sort of, uh, you know, things that just happen that can change your life like that, you know? And suddenly you find yourself in a, in a, in a new role, you know? Just, just like what happened now, like, you know, that, that one minute I'm sort of over in Vancouver, then I go down to Los Angeles, and next minute I'm flying back and I'm doing a Shannara in the, back in New Zealand, which uh, I couldn't be any happier for. Oh, well, you know, like, like the new Suicide Squad film, he's def yeah, Deathstroke's definitely in it. Um, I'm almost absolutely certain they're not going to be using any television version of, of the characters in that film. I think Joe Manganiello's up for it. He's a mate of mine, actually. It'd be interesting to see how Joe pulls it off, but... You know, Joe's been under consideration for Deathstroke. Uh, you know, but yeah, yeah, you know, uh, DC's going strong, you know. I mean, they're going very strong in the television market. And, uh, you know, there's always these talks of if it's doing well in the television market, they're going to take it to feature films. So I, I think suicide, suicide Squad's for certain. Arzog's completely motion capture. So basically, uh, you know, it's a body suit that's got dots all over it. And whenever I move, it creates motion, you know, exact replication of the motion that I do. Uh, yeah, so, so it's all motion captures like, you know, I go in there and they, they, they want my physical performance. And then afterwards, you know, I've got this GoPro camera that's on a helmet that, that films your face. So everything about my expressions and movement is what they use. Uh, but it's just like, it's, it's like just applying body paint. 
you know, that's that's the way they create it. You know, the artists draw over the top of your motion to create that character. And then I do the voice later in, in, in post-production. I do it with uh, ADR. You know, so I'll have the scripts and I'll... I've got them on the day, but I don't really know them that well on the day that I shoot, the first day, because Peter never hands out the scripts. So I usually get flown in, like I got flown in from the States last time, landed in Wellington, I was at the hotel, I'm starting the next morning, and the script is in my hotel waiting for me. But if, if you've ever tried to read black speech on a page, it's not easy, mate. It's like, it's like taking German class for, you know, you know like as a six-year-old. Oh, to be honest, uh, Katie Lotz, who played, yeah, who played the young Black Canary, just because she's a great laugh, you know. I, I enjoy being with people who are, you know, who have fun on set. You know, some people take their job very seriously, and that's that's fair enough. But you know, for me, being being with a bunch of people for a long period of time, you know, I think I've learned it over the years. When I first did my first jobs, I was very, you know. I'm the actor, you know, I have to be inside myself and just, you know, it's all about you. But I, I think when you find, when you get the most out of working with a team, is to be part of that team, you know. And now I've, now I've come to the point in my career where I'll walk in and I'll say, hey, to the lighting department and the camera guys, and I'll go, hey boys, what's going on? Yeah, 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 let's go, hey, let's do it. You know, and have fun with them, you know, because at the end of the day, then when you're in the middle of a shot, whether it's serious or whether it's emotional or whatever, I can still look at them and go, Hey brother, let's go. Here we go, and then just turn it on. You know what I mean? It, it's such a you know it's such a focused kind of a field that if you just sit there in the in the moment all the time, you know, as an actor, I think it can burn you out. You know, so I've learned over time to just relax and go through the motions and and, and, and be appreciative of the people that are around me. But uh, but you know, Katie was just a good laugh. You know, uh, you know all the girls. Steve's Steve's good value. But he's got a lot on his shoulders, you know, and so a lot of the time he's just really focused on his job, you know, and, and, and you know, trying to hold that, that uh, you know, that leading role position. Uh, but, but that's all cool, you know what I mean? Well, you know what, mate, I'm, I'm 46 this year. So, you know, when I, when, I, when I first started up on Spartacus, I was probably in my peak. And, uh, you know, I worked really hard. But, but something about fighting as a gladiator, you know, doing a lot of sword and shield work, is a, it, it takes a major toll on your shoulders. A lot of the boys that came out of Spartacus have got rotator cuff injuries. You know, like, basically it's RSI of your shoulder joints. And, uh, you know, uh, when I got to Arrow, I actually backed off it a little bit because I had some tears. And just uh, three weeks ago, I went and had an MRI, and I, my supraspinatus has an 80% tear, thickness tear, which means I have to have an operation on it. So I've got to detach my, uh, you know, my supraspinatus uh, from the bone and reattach it and, and do a whole bunch of stuff. So, you know, this, this especially with, with sort of doing a lot of physical roles like I have done, the, the danger is that we shoot so much, and we, and we you know, it, it, it's hard to keep your gym regime going up in between. Like before you start shooting uh, a series, you know, you usually get in and you get yourself really ready, but then during the actual shooting process, you find very little time. But luckily it's at uh, Shannara, they've actually got a gym set up there, so I'm gonna be going up there doing a lot of rehab work as soon as I get this operation done, so I'll be back on top of it. But I mean, mate, at the end of the day, it's a very competitive field. I found that when I did Spartacus, that the way that I stood out was to stay on top of all of that stuff and be leading the pack. You know, boys came in on that show and I'd always just, like Crixus, I'd try to lead. And so whenever we did fitness tests and stuff like that, I, I, I used to push myself to, you know, throw it up, mate. You know, we I remember the, the first couple of weeks of getting ready for uh, the last season. And I wasn't as fit as I was in the first season, but I wasn't gonna let any of the boys beat me, eh? And we did the like the uh, the first day, the first day back, we did the entry level fitness test for the uh, New Zealand Special Forces, and uh, so we had to do a whole bunch of stuff, and then it finished with like a three and a half k run. And uh, I remember setting off on that run. We ran we ran up in Auckland along the foreshore, and I remember in the last kilometer of that run, bro, I was just like wanting to throw up, you know. But I just wouldn't let any of the boys overtake me, and I was just. 
they were racing up behind I was going wow but but you know it was it, what happened with doing that prior to going into filming is the moment that we got in, into those arenas we already had that mentality you know when I got out there I was just you know going to do Crixus the way Crixus was and all the other boys were in there just knowing we had a high level of performance that we were always trying to achieve so you know the physical side of it was very big at Spartacus Barry I don't know what his secret is, brother, but he's always big for some reason. <laughs> but he's big, you know. I mean, Barry's, you know, Barry's fantastically kind of like, he's a physical trainer and all that sort of stuff, so he, he knows how to get big. But, uh, yeah, yeah, no, he's done really well. Oh, yeah. uh, you know, I, 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 I mean, my, my, I don't know, I feel like my career's been kind of like a, like a tree, you know? And uh, a lot of the hard work is the stuff that you do at the beginning where, you, where you're not recognized, where there's no branches that bear fruit. You know, where you become more solid just because you've got to try to become something from nothing. You know what I mean? So that's the trunk. That's the trunk of a career. You know, like I, I can't tell you how many years of just, you know, I, I speak to young actors come up to me here and they go, can you give me some advice on being an actor? And I don't know how to really tell them about that trunk period. Because that trunk period is just the way any person has to become strong within themselves to make the decision to start growing branches to become a tree in any career that they choose, you know. And the trunk period is just a, a purely individual thing, you know. But 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 you know, it's perseverance, you know. And and, and and you know, once I started getting roles, you know, I remember the first really significant role that I got was uh, was on Xena. On Xena, I got the role of Mark Antony. And I remember thinking to myself, like, that was a significant role. I thought it was, I'm playing Mark Antony. For crying out loud, that's a, that's a major historic figure and quite a dramatic role, you know. Uh, Lucy Lawless was going to play Cleopatra in the episode, even though she was Xena, pretending to be Cleopatra, trying to protect Egypt from Rome. It was, it was Lucy Lawless, you know. And uh, I remember going to the audition in Australia, and I thought Lucy Lawless was like six foot tall, which she is once you put shoes on, you know. But I thought, I'm probably too short to be Mark Antony. So when I was in the audition, I went, oh, I'm six foot one. And when I got there, all my costumes were too long. <laughs> and one of my cousins was in the wardrobe department. She went, oh, Manu, I knew there were no six footers in the Bennett family anyway. <laughs> it was funny. But, uh, but you know, that, that first role was really significant for me. I, I, that's when I actually thought, oh, I'm an, I'm an, I'm an actor playing a, playing a really significant role. And uh, Rob Tappert, who was the producer on that, then cast me several years later in 30 Days of Night with Josh Hartnett, which was a horror movie that shot here in, in Auckland. Now, because I'd done those two shows with Rob Tappert, Rob Tappert then had me cast as Crixus. And so really my relationship in order to get the Crixus role started in 1999, even though I shot that series in 2009. So there had been a ten, yeah, that trunk thing that I'm telling you about. That trunk had started to build into a branch from 1999, you know, with Rob Tappert, this producer who believed in me as an actor. So you know, when I got when I got uh, you know Spartacus, that for sure was the first role that I would ever have got to get an international audience. And you know, Spartacus was is massive internationally. You know, I mean, it's it's I can go to any country on the planet, and people would have watched Spartacus. You know. And, uh, you know, Spartacus then led to, you know, the moment that I went down to do The Hobbit, you know, Peter Jackson came up to me and he said, I love you in, in Spartacus. And that's why, you know, I think you're going to do a good job as Arzog, you know, so that led into that. And, you know, then working with Peter Jackson, I mean, you, you know, you can't really, I mean, to this day, like, I, I, I can't be in anything bigger than The Hobbit. Really, I mean, more people on the planet will watch that movie than almost any movie that'll ever be made. You know, it's, 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 it's such big numbers, so it's hard to go over that. So, so that was a really significant thing to be a part of. Uh, you know, Arrow, Arrow for me was the first, the first series that I ever shot that was um, not in Australia or New Zealand. Oh no, so I, I did a movie once in Japan, but that was kind of weird. That was kind of like taking a, taking a trip. Don't listen to me, kids. But it was, but that was, but you know, so, so, you know, each, each role has had a, a, a step, 
you know, and, and, and I feel like Shannara, even though it's, you know, I thought that going to America and sort of pushing and becoming, you know, an actor in America would make me feel like I was moving up, but actually coming back to New Zealand and being part of Shannara, that makes me feel like I'm moving up because I feel like my place, even though I'm sort of going for that international career, by strengthening an international career within New Zealand is the best thing that I can do for myself and my family because my kids live here and, you know, and my partner. So it's kind of like, you know, my life is being strengthened by actually coming back and doing a Shannara rather than being in America and everyone sort of like getting away from the roots a bit. I've sort of come back to the trunk. So, you know, uh, you know, Crixus, Azov, you know, uh, Alanon now. I mean, they're all the same to me. They're all part of the same, you know, evolution. And uh, yeah, I just, I just really appreciate each of the roles, you know. And all I hope is that, you know, Alanon, when you see it, and I think you will, I mean, anybody who liked the, the, liked the energy of Crixus, you know, the fight of Crixus, and then maybe, maybe enjoyed Gandalf throughout the, the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit thing, I think I got those two things that I've mixed them up into this Alamon character. And he's badass, I'm telling you, he's badass. And the filming of it looks really good, looks really, really good. I mean, it looks better than anything I've seen on television. Yeah. So I'm looking forward to that coming out, yeah. Well, at one stage they rang me after I'd already been shooting several scenes on the island with, uh, with Shadow. And they said, Manu, we're going to make a love triangle. You're in love with Shadow. And I was like, I'd already done all these scenes with her, and in my head as Slade Wilson, I just sort of looked at her as a young girl. And I thought she was a very young girl, and I thought, you know, Slade's going to look a bit like a, you know, funny old guy, he's on this young girl kind of thing, you know? And I was a little bit dubious about it, but then, you know, in the actual comic book series, you know, Deathstroke had a relationship in there that was dubiously recognized by the community, comic book community, as being a little bit of a, like, a similar relationship as as that, you know? So I think they were aware of that and, and had gone for that storyline, but, you know, I always sort of made the... What I decided upon was instead of make it like a... like just this antagonistic kind of, I love her, she's mine, not yours, kind of thing, I, I, I just based it upon caring for her. And I think the care of that the care that, I, that Slade showed for Shadow, that when she died, it kind of vilified anything that he did from that point on. I still meet people who come up to me and they go, I can't believe you killed Moira, but I really like Slade still. And I think the reason why they like him is because he had kind of like an endearing nature with both Oliver and Shadow prior to the Mirakuru. And I mean, one of the pieces of the puzzle that you have to go back through is like, you know, Oliver injected him with the Mirakuru. It wasn't Slade going like, I'm going to become the Mirakuru junkie and turn into a crazy, you know, killer. It was something where he was sitting there dying and Oliver came out and said, Slade, Slade, I'm going to inject you with this or you're going to die. And he went, well, it looks like I'm going to die anyway, kids, so whatever. You know, next thing, here comes Deathstroke. You know, so it was great writing. But, you know, it's interesting playing Deathstroke because Deathstroke's kind of like this enigmatic character in that DC comic world, you know, where his wrongdoings always seem to have some sort of justification. He has a moral code that the audience seems to agree with. Loathingly enough, it's, it's against the lead character, but it still somehow ignites support from some kind of broken human perspective because we're all broken. And I think people understand, I mean, in America, there's a lot of broken soldiers in that country and they get Slade. And I get a lot of them coming up to me all the time going like, man, we love Slade, you know, he's like, you know, da da da, da. So, so, you know, there's, there's this kind of logic to the character. You know, he's not, he's not some kind of penguin or, you, you know, he's not, even though the, the new penguin on Gotham, I love him. You know, he's fantastic, you get where he's coming from. You know, but, but when, you, when, you, when you can sympathize with a character and you realize their humanity and what comes behind something that then becomes like a mask and a... The thing is, is that, you know, the, to be true to, to like the, the comic book character as well, written, written by Marv Wolfman, you know, there's, 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 there's not... The, the evil aspect of Deathstroke, evil, the word evil, you've got to be really careful with Slade because it's, it's, it's not really that. It's just that it's the grey matter, 
you know, it's the grey matter between the black and white, you know, that, that he's always on, you know, so I've always wanted to keep the integrity for that. I personally wasn't very happy, and I'm going to say it out loud, with what happened in the end of the second season and the middle of this season, where, you know, Slade gets his ass kicked. Because that doesn't happen at Deathstroke in the comic book world, you know. I know they're feeding their arrow necessities, but, you know, I would have really preferred if it had taken the whole team to take down Deathstroke. And, you know, then you went like, shit, you know, death shirt, Deathstroke just can't be beaten because that's kind of how he exists in the comic book world. I mean, the new, the new series that is coming out is fantastic, you know. But, you know, that's their version of it and whatnot, so i gotta, I got to go for the ride. But, uh, you know, yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's an amazing character. You know, I'm, I'm lucky again to be, you know, given such a, a, an iconic character to play. It's wonderful. They probably deserve each other. <laughs> That's a Slade answer. Uh, you know what? I don't think it'll happen, personally, because it's just it, it just it, it it just keeps that keeps that tension there. You know, it keeps that kind of you know. It's what the audience audience wants. You know. But, you know, it would be like Clark Kent and, uh, what's her name? <laughs> Lois Lane, yeah. You know, who knows, it could get to that point. I usually want to go to Pihar and go surfing. Uh, I usually want to, uh, I don't know, go sit down at Dizzen Gobs on Ponsonby Road and have a coffee and just, you know, see some locals and have a chat. You know, I, I tell you what, mate, it's, it's, it's home, you know, it really is home for me, you know, and uh, you can travel the world, you can, you can be a part of the Hollywood system and, and, and get to the heights that you want to get to as an actor, like, like I'm experiencing, which is, you know, has its positives and negatives. It's a wonderful thing, but it's also just a, it's a fantasy, you know, it, 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 you know to, to, to be a celebrity, it's it's a it's a misnomer, my friend. You know, it's it's like it's a wonderful thing to connect with people and and to be in a to be involved in this industry because it's a an emotional art form that connects people through story and and makes us all feel the purpose of why we're here, how we're here, what we can do, what we're capable of, good and evil, all these sort of things that balance us out on this planet. But at the end of the day, nothing means more to me than three little girls that live up in Auckland with mum. You know, my daughters, and, uh, and you know, when, I, when, I'm, when I'm going out just like any man to earn the money to put the food on the table to come home and be with my family, when I come back to New Zealand, it's my home, mate. So, so you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, really, it's really struck home on this particular occasion. I mean, I can go over there. I'm, I mean, I'm reading for a major film now, you know, studio film in America, and, uh, you know, if I get that opportunity, I'll, I'll probably jump on it and go over there and do a film. But, mate, every time I fly in over the Waitakere's, brother, and I know I'm home, you know, like there's, there's, there's nothing better than to, to hear that. G'day, bro. Welcome home, bro. <laughs> you know, it's cool. It's cool. And I'm, and I'm, I'm always happy to get home. And, uh, you know, it's, it's nice to be in a part of New Zealand and come to a convention as well, because I've been doing these in America for years now, I've, you know, for months now. And, uh, you know, I've only done a couple in New Zealand. I've only done one of these in William for Bill. And uh, now I've done one down in Christchurch. So... You know, it's it's humbling and it's uh, and it's an honour to, to get down here and uh, you know to have have a New Zealand uh, family fan base as well. So thank you very much, everyone, for following me. And uh, and I, 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 if you if you like my character that I've done so far, anything I've created, I swear to you, you're gonna you're gonna like Shannara. <laughs> Alamon's badass. You know, I'm not just pitching that out there. I just think it's a, it's been a it's been a good growth with me for characters, and I think Alamon's gonna be. Gonna be another one that I'm that I'm hoping you'll all enjoy. So thanks guys. Thanks, Death Joker.